the true message of the Bible has been hijacked and compromised in almost every area in our country and as a result in many other countries because the missionaries would come from America and they took this distorted gospel to other countries who are now banning American missionaries from their country because of how destructive the American gospel has been to other countries. And this is how the devil takes over. He does it through compromise. And as believers, we don't think anything of making little compromises here and there until there is no standard of righteousness left. So I think everybody is looking at the state of affairs our country is in right now. And everybody is freaking out and thinking that an election could maybe salvage this. But the problem is so much of this got rooted so deeply so long ago and nobody did anything. Nobody did anything. Nobody wanted to leave their comfortable seat. Nobody wanted to go out and, and fight for anything. They still don't, they still don't. And so as a result, there's going to be significant loss and people are angry and blaming everyone else when compromise has been the gate that has let all this come through. We believe, defend, and adhere to the truth until it gets in the way of our comfort and our ease of lifestyle. And we claim a standard as long as it doesn't mess up what I want right now. So a lot of people became very comfortable living the way that this country allowed them to live. And they felt that it was owed to them. So many that we work with, they have entitlement issues. They feel that they're owed something. And it's very hard out in this field now because the demand is so great for people to be served because they feel that they're owed that and there's always more that's owed to them so you can literally give everything you have to them and then they're angry because you either stopped because you ran out of everything or there's just so much entitlement and that's what this country has caused is a lot of entitlement and people don't want to give it up and they don't want anything to happen to cause them to lose it either. And we see what happens when people do start to feel they're losing things. Then we start to watch all the unrest and the violence. And we're in a pretty serious situation right now because of the compromise that has come through, deeply rooted, covered over, and become so normal that nobody can even tell how they're compromised according to what God would want. John MacArthur says, we have so long compromised with the world. We have become so engulfed in its materialistic viewpoint, in its economics, in its style of life, that there is little possibility that we can even understand what an uncompromising life really even means. We fight to be separated from the world and yet we're unable to define what that separation means because we've been so brainwashed by the system. We have accepted the world's thought patterns. We've accepted the world's value systems. We've accepted the world's attitudes. We've accepted its morality. In so many cases, we've accepted its economics. We are indulging ourselves. And even though we know the Bible teaches something, if we feel we want to do it, we go ahead and do it anyway. That's the gospel that has pretty much run prevalent through all of America. And after all, most preachers will tell people, I hear it all the time, that they say, this is what God's grace is for. 
That's why Jesus died for this exact purpose, because he knew we would keep on sinning. So he paid for all of our sin because he knew we would keep on sinning. I hear that all the time. People tell me that all the time, that they were told that by their preacher, by their, by their chaplains, wherever they were. That is so outrageously flawed. It is so outrageously flawed. It is certainly not the message of the Bible. It is certainly not coming from someone who honors Jesus. It is absolutely stunning to hear that somebody who claims to love Jesus actually said something like that. For every time that you defend sin in someone's life, you need to decide if you're working for the enemy or if you're working for Jesus in their salvation because you're working for one of them. If you are someone who speaks for the kingdom in any kind of ministry role or any role where people see you as a, as a voice of truth, and you tell them that, or you minimize any sin or compromise, you have become a missionary and a voice for the devil. No question about it. The facts of the Bible are clear and consistent. God is uncompromising. He never compromises his word. He never compromises his principles, ever. And it doesn't matter who you are or how anointed you claim to be, God does not compromise his word for anyone, for any reason. The opportunities to compromise are only going to increase more and more as we move into what's clearly the final days. We get these questions frequently. And many who claim to be followers of Jesus will inch by inch find themselves accepting allegiance to the Antichrist very soon. And the Bible speaks of that large group of people, even calls them the elect, who do this. They'll leave Jesus because they want to eat. At the end, that's going to be the reason. They just want to eat. They didn't prepare in advance. They didn't prepare to stand at the end. They want food. So they're going to sign on permanently to the Antichrist system. There will be no way back from that. You need to choose today. If you're going to start standing for God, you need to choose today. And you need to start standing for God today. Because that day is not very far away. And if you can't stand for him today, you certainly won't at one moment be able to suddenly stand for him when you're getting your last opportunity to stand for him and go to heaven or completely reject Christ the last chance you have. You need to start now because it's a real process. Compromise is not like somebody's just going to walk up to you and give you a long time to process. That never happens like that. We have a sudden invitation and we need to make a decision and if you have not learned to do this consistently you're not going to do it if we compromise and give in to temptation as a habitual lifestyle we turn into cowards that's what we become and the Bible is also clear that all cowards are going to go to the lake of fire for all of eternity so a person who embraces compromise and minimizes it, they become a coward when faced with having to side with Jesus or the lie, and the Bible's already declared their condemnation, hell. And this is why this message is so critical. You can ignore it, you can laugh at the messenger, but one day you're going to stand there facing the truth that you refuse to listen when you had a chance and that also will be exposed to you that you had an opportunity and that you completely turned from it that you mocked it that you made fun of those who do either way it will be fully exposed that you had the chance to stop compromising and you chose not to we are all going to experience an increasing strength 
inside if we start to determine we are not going to compromise the cross of Jesus Christ. That's the part where God meets us, where we say, I will, I will follow you, Jesus. God comes and he does the heavy lifting for us when our, when our decision is, I'm laying it all down for Jesus. And the gift of God at that point is a strength that meets you when you most need it. You've made your choice. You know you're going through. But yet at the same time, you're terrified and you have no idea what's coming out at the end or where. Or you have no idea if you will come through. But you have made the decision to not compromise. The grace of God at that moment is incredible. I remember seeing a picture of Joan of Arc burning at the stake when I was young. And I remember looking at her face, and I'm sure, you know, it was a painting someone did, but I've looked into her life since that time. And I thought, how can someone be roped to a post and be on fire, like her whole body's on fire, but she's looking up and her face was peaceful. It was almost like she didn't know she was on fire. And then the story of Stephen in the Bible is similar where he's being stoned to death, which would be a really painful way to die also. And he's looking up and he's seeing Jesus. And he also was in awe of what he could see. There's something about that moment when you have chosen to not compromise Jesus, that intimacy you get with God at that point, at, when he joins you in that moment, will be worth it all and this is the gift that god gives to those who set their course to never back down or find a way out of taking a stand and standing for jesus the one who hung naked in public for us he's the one watching each time that we choose to back down to stay silent to let our friends continue on in compromise and sin and not say anything as we're claiming to be followers of Christ, we're allowing sin to abound all around us. We're allowing people to be spiteful, hateful, full of judgment, persecutors. We don't say anything. A whole community is so lost that think they're saved. And some of us see it, but many don't say anything. And a whole mass of people, I am stunned at how many people in America claim to be Christian, but they stay silent as this country continues to plummet to its death. It's not going to get easier. You need to count the cost and decide if you're going to stand with Jesus or if you're going to fit in with what is now a sham of true Christianity in this country. And if you do that, if you do nothing and you stay the course, you will likely hear, depart from me, I never knew you. If you stay in a, what is status quo Christianity in this country? And those of us who represent being ministers of the gospel, we will be held accountable for how we represented Jesus, number one. And if we did not take the eternity of those listening to us far more seriously than our reputation, our wage, our success, our popularity, we will find that we are also forbidden entrance into heaven, not leading the lost to Jesus in a way that produces a surrender to holiness, purity, a life of sacrifice for the sake of the cross is a terrible offense to God. And those who take an easier path in the gospel that they proclaim, he says, you will have the blood of your hearers on your hands. Those that are led into deception, we will be accountable for. And we are mandated to make clear if we speak in any role that represents Jesus, if we do not make the consequences clear of what is sin, which is self-serving, isn't even always outrageous, sinful. It is, I do what I want to do, even if it's in the church. A refusal to lay down self 
is what it is. A lifestyle of myself rules my life. And if we do not point that out and make it clear that that person has to be laid down so that Jesus Christ can rise up and live through us, we will face the wrath of God ourselves for giving a false message, a false gospel. He gave Jesus over to a terrible death for the very reason that truth be proclaimed and it will not be brushed over. If you're in a situation where you're not pulling anyone up, but they're pulling you down or they're pulling you across and it's getting worse and worse as time goes on, you need to like sit up and make some fast changes. If you are a leader in the faith or just we are all ministers, everyone is a minister for one side or the other. You're either supporting the side of the enemy and the world or you're supporting the kingdom of God. If you look at the influence you are having, just turn around and look behind you at the influence you're having and who you're influencing, the people around you. You can see the influence and the impact you're having on people. If they're not being pulled towards heaven, or at least pulled towards heaven to where they're resisting the truth and having to boldly resist the truth because they don't like what you stand for, there is no neutral ground here. You're working for one kingdom or the other, and the people who lean on you and learn from you will show you which kingdom. They're either becoming more confident in the flesh, even if they're religious, or they're becoming broken and emptying themselves of themselves to pursue Jesus Christ and only Jesus Christ. And in order to keep from being uncontaminated by the world, we must choose to hold firmly to a strong loyalty to God or we will find ourselves compromised every day, many times. Human nature is what the Bible calls carnality or the self, the carnal man, produced by friendship with this world it wars against God. It directly wars against God. And God hates compromise. And by its very definition, we know what is right. And if we seek to find a way around doing it, he sees it. He sees our heart, not just the behavior. And he knows every excuse that we make to throw him under a bus and think that we're going to fix it later. And to be part of the kingdom of God, we can never allow ourselves to become part of the world system. It's totally, they absolutely are opposing each other. They're opposing kingdoms. There is no middle ground. Things within life that reflect more of a life of sin and do not glorify God are counted as waste by God, according to Philippians 3, 7 through 9. And compromise reaches nobody. It serves Satan. And if we lower our standards to increase our reach, then we're defeating our own purpose and our own mission. You never see that in the Bible where they went out and adopted the ways of the world to try to blend in with the world, to pull the world to the world. You never saw that. And you certainly won't hear God sanction that. God is angered by that, that we have to so cheapen him to go steal from the world's ways to actually pull people to him and then we think somehow everyone should see that we're brilliant it is absolutely stunning that that will cross through anyone's mind and that they won't filter that as i can't even believe that thought went through my mind that we would bring the world's ways into the equation at all when talking about the holy God, the creator of the universe is completely, it is completely insane to even speak like that. But the truth is the world has evangelized us instead. And most people actually know it. I'm very certain that most people who go to some of these, well, you see them now that are getting exposed, these larger churches and some of these concerts where they're just 
wild like rock concerts i used to go to those i don't see much difference and then they leave the concert and their lifestyle is absolutely the same as the world in fact they've created a culture which is a different culture of faith that looks like um it's like a celebrity gospel type is they actually do call it that where people are are so served and so um it, it is so rich in experience but of the world if the holy spirit were there everyone would be on their face crying out to god for forgiveness for being so self-absorbed that would be the truth caleb andrews writes of the types of people who compromise a relationship with god for the world and he said there are generally four reasons that christians will compromise god one fear of rejection the fear of being alone or pointed out from a crowd two is tolerance sympathy or indulgence for beliefs or practices differing from god's three pleasure the willingness to give in to be happy four laziness too lazy to fight for what god believes and you give in you just don't want to fight it there are four stages of compromise he says one is attraction something gets your attention Two, justification. We make reasons for the wrongs to be okay because of the great desire that we have for it. Three, indulgence. Restraints are removed and the conscience is hardened. Four, redefinition. We redefine what wrong is according to the Bible or present in our lives to remove all guilt. So what the Bible says, we just tweak the words a little bit because we're gonna make it fit our life, we'll just find another verse that will make that all look different. And then when we be, meet God, we'll just throw up that other verse that says, well, but I thought you forget. He's watching you do it the whole time. He's watching you craft witchcraft to try to make not only just trick God, but all the, yourself, the deception, the consequence of that level of deception is is definitely not um, heaven. Compromise is simply changing the question to fit the answer. Compromise Christians make Jesus want to vomit them out of his mouth. That's what he says in Revelation 3, 15 and 16. And they are truly viewed with more anger by God than those lost in sin. So. This is not about the lost. Nothing I'm talking about is about those who are lost in sin and don't claim to know Christ. This is not even about them. We're called to love them. We're called to be, befriend them, not sin with them, but love them and love them and love them, love them and love them and love them and love them some more. We need them to experience the nature of Jesus. We don't sin with them, but we love them. But Christians, those who claim to be followers of Christ, who feel they're going to heaven, if they are in any way aligned with the world, friends with the world, and they hit that category of lukewarm because they are compromising holiness and purity and the righteousness in the gospel, God is angered by them. It would be better for them that they didn't know anything at all because this way he knows they know and that they're sidestepping the truth the truth which isn't a book of words to him it is why Jesus came it is why Jesus died the whole battle in the spirit realm is over this very point so if you think it is god's rules and they're too strict it isn't even about that it is about why jesus was given up for me and you that's why it's not compromise for god he will not compromise if a, ch a person is 
finding some way to live a balanced life between God and the world, and they're applauding themselves because they have found a way to do that where my friends know I'm a Christian, but yet I can go, I, I can do a lot of things because I'm not tempted by that thing. We often hear this in the recovery field where someone comes through, they get themselves sober from chemicals, it, chemicals or a chemical that they call their DOC in the in this recovery world, drug of choice. They get themselves free of that. So let's say their drug of choice was meth and then they get off meth and they come back out and they're like, hmm, I can drink, I can go hang out in the bars because I'm not returning to meth. I can drink all I want because it's not my DOC. We constantly hear this. They say, well, drinking's not my problem. Meth is my problem. So they, reach, they go and start fishing out of the pond of other options, thinking somehow that each particular option is, it's all just throwing things at the wall. The bigger issue is, I'm still going to do what I want to do. That's the bigger issue. That is the issue. So if there is a balance that you have found somehow where you can walk down your life and people know I love Jesus, but you know, I got kind of some of this too. I'll get, he knows I'm doing the best I can do. That definitely falls into the lukewarm category because you're spending a lot more time building that world side and keeping yourself steady in that than you are racing away from the sin, racing away from the parts of your life that absolutely make Jesus look weak and not worth it. Not worth it. You represent him, you say, but at the same time, you make him look completely carnal. You make him look nothing like nothing like who he is the joke will be on you in the end because there is no such thing in the eyes of God there is no balance between the world and his kingdom and the person who thinks they have found one will end up in hell if they do not turn from what is simply deceptive religion because a true, genuine relationship with Jesus Christ makes you so passionate about Jesus Christ, not religion, not rules, not I can do this, I can't do that, nothing about that. You are simply so passionate about Jesus Christ that nothing else matters. And the world around us is soon to be engulfed in flames. It's going to be the greatest tribulation that has ever hit the whole earth. And I know I, I was with someone last week, a friend of mine, and when I told him we we're talking about some of the events going on and I, I brought up, I said, it, it just seems crazy. I've been alive all these years and I've had people talking about end times for most of my life. But to actually see specific events playing out that are marked as end time events is shocking to even me. And so I'm saying this to this person and their eyes are watering and they're looking at me like they said, you're scaring me. I'm not going to be able to sleep tonight. I said, why? This is a person who I met in Bible study years ago. I mean, they certainly are far more um, churched than I have ever been. I said, well, Revelation, you haven't read that? And they said, that you don't think that's an allegory? I said, it, no, it's a revelation, but it's definitely true. And this person was so shocked by me saying that there was an end, that Revelation is definitely events that are going to happen, that they were going to have to go find their pastor to talk to them 
which is shocking. They said, I wonder how my pastor feels about this. I said, this has never come up. They were most worried that they weren't going to be able to sleep. They were scared. And I, I just, I was so shocked. I called Tati and I said, I'm so shocked. I feel guilty that I upset them that much. But at the same time, I was so shocked. This is someone who lives in Minneapolis. Like, I, there's churches everywhere, TV, social media. Everybody's talking about this. I just don't understand why people would be shocked that this is considered true to God, but it is. And sadly, many who are watching for Jesus to take them to heaven because they're all sitting there waiting for that rapture, you see all that too. We're about to be raptured. All this stuff about we're going to be raptured before anything bad happens. That goes against what's happening everywhere else in the world where people are being martyred more than ever before. You cannot take that we're going to be raptured before we're persecuted in any other country because it's already a lie there. They are being persecuted. They are being killed for their faith. There is no way God has promised that because then he lied to the rest of the world. So many of those who are watching for Jesus to come are going to hell by the standard that God set himself of what is required to go to heaven. And many who consider themselves saved know far more than they're willing to live up to about what is in the word. They know there's more, but they don't live up to it and they don't commit to living up to it. And they also don't commit to finding out exactly what is the rest in clarity. They're excited by good sound preaching. When there's a great sermon, they're the first ones to get excited and invigorated by it. They believe in the doctrines of God and yet they are constantly doing things that confuse those around them and serve the side of Satan by choosing comfort, by choosing the easiest life they can, the most beautiful, longest vacations, the best lifestyle possible. They believe in the kingdom of God and even seem to desire it. They say they hate Satan. They believe in hell, yet they do things to actually bring strength to his kingdom which is all about self-service and self-pleasure. That's what his kingdom stands for. Making sure my life is good, making sure that I am happy, making sure that my needs are being met. They believe that time is short, but they want to wait. They don't want Jesus to return and they get upset when you say Jesus is coming back because they're not done here. They love this world. It isn't because they're having tent crusades. It's because they are invested in the world and they don't want Jesus to come back because it'll cut short what they're doing that they love here that isn't tent crusades or leading people to Christ. The only concern if we are a genuine follower of Christ is that we reach more for heaven today. Tati and I got called to a hospital yesterday and we saw someone on life support and the jarring impact of seeing that and I've seen things but every time you see that essentially someone is is not there and you think Here's this family standing around crying and wanting you to somehow make their person right with God. 31 year old, fatal heart attack. And the family wants peace knowing that something can be fixed here because they didn't expect this obviously. And I wonder how many times a day that happens where people just plow through life having all this self-focus and, and then they get the call 
like these parents did, that your child is on life support, no signs of life, you need to come to the hospital and make a decision. And then they're like, we need to call somebody in the clergy. We need them, we need to make sure that they're okay with God. And I wish people could see that once a week so that they would understand the despair that hits people at that moment when everyone is standing around that knows them going I don't think that ended well because at that point it's too late to fix it this moment right here is the one where you should go to those people and you should tell them I'm terrified of that happening because most people that end up there did not know it was coming they had no idea it just suddenly came and they've said their last words that person isn't going to speak again it's happening all the time now So now you know that you should be pleading at least once with them to get right with God so that you aren't standing there that day going, I just didn't expect it to end this quick because most of the time it does and it's terrible to witness it. A lot of people in this group, they know holiness is required to please God. They actually like to read books, listen to podcasts about holiness, about God, and they love to see it in other people, but they rest well knowing that it's not likely attainable for them personally because they're more screwed up than most or their childhood was rough or they were victimized by someone at some point or there's no decent churches around them, or they, and the reasons are endless why people say, I have not yet committed to walking in holiness and purity. I have not yet chosen that. They make up all kinds of reasons that are not about themselves. They blame it on something else. And they believe because of what they've been taught that God's grace is going to cover their ongoing sin. That is a lie. That is not in the Bible. And they are not ready to meet God. If that is them, they're not ready to meet God because they will not be ushered into heaven. They ultimately show that they dread and refuse personal sacrifice and self-denial. They fear being considered narrow-minded, and so they go to the opposite extreme, and they give many excuses for going to the opposite extreme. Because there's too many of us over here already that are actually pointing out the truth of the word, and that offends people. I get told that frequently. That's offensive. Wendy, that's offensive. You turn people off with that. Well, I'm not putting my eggs in any basket of who I turn off because everybody keeps lying to me about what's required for salvation. And that happened to me when I was dying in addiction. Nobody would speak the truth until one day when it's too late, a pastor and his wife stepped up and spoke the truth and told me, let go of your sin, let go. If you don't let go of your sin, you won't receive salvation because you have to let go of your sin to be saved from your sin. And so there's lots of reasons why people go to the other extreme than speaking the truth because they make up things like, if you do that, you turn them away from Christ. Well, you know what? That's not true either, and God knows it. 
They turn away from Christ because they don't want Him, and they don't want to stop sinning. That's why they turn away from Christ. It's not because of the messenger. So you can blame the messenger all day long. If you resist the truth, it's because you love the darkness. It's that simple. God knows it, and everyone else knows it. They often forget that they should first and always honor God. They love the works, and they're trying to stay in as much as they can because they love to look like they're working in ministry. But they can excuse and justify their diet of violent sexual TV shows and movies, places that you certainly wouldn't want your pastor to catch you at, being in questionable relationships, doing things with these people that you also would not do in front of your clergy. And they have convinced themselves that it's good to mix with the world to expose them to Jesus. Yet they know that they have chosen to mix with the world because they love the world. They know that. They just want one more day, one more day, one more day with the world. And then they're on life support suddenly with no chance to make a decision. And the family is crying, worried that their loved one went to hell. There's nothing that we should want to hang on to one more day in exchange for Jesus. Most people, it oftentimes is sex. And I think, how much sex does a person need to reject Jesus to have more? It's mind boggling that people who are, I've seen them, seasoned ministers. They were revivalists, they were evangelists, and they now are losing their families because they will not give up porn. They found porn at a late stage of their life and they abandoned the gospel for porn. And they think God's grace covers them. They never knew Jesus if they think that. They never loved him because if they did, that would never even come out their mouth. They cannot find it in themselves to do the battle with their besetting sin, whether it's because they're lazy because they're prideful, because they love their feelings, they love being in their feelings, they love the feelings that this creates, which is completely hedonism, worship from 101, the devil. They're vain, they're impatient, but they allow it to remain in their mind and they justify it by thinking, that's just the way I am. My family is the same way, that's just the way we are. However, they're not happy because they know too much and they have a conscience that tells them that what they have chosen to commit to and hang on to is going to cost them. Oftentimes, in the deepest, darkest points of the night, they know this is going to cost me. This is going to cost me everything. They know that. But they keep busy enough and distracted enough because they want it one more time, one more time, one more time and then they're on life support. The responsibility of every Christian is to renew their mind and find the will of God for their life. Every single Christian, that's our responsibility. We should live for God and be transformed in our minds to what He desires every single day. And if your days are about what you desire, you don't know Him. You certainly don't belong to Him. And just as you expect your spouse to consider you in all their choices, God expects the same. He calls it a marriage. So we don't get to be in a marriage with God and then go do whatever we want every day without Him involved. That's not even reality. No one should compromise a walk with God to imitate the world for anyone or anything. And the true people of God know who they worship and they know how to worship Him. And He wants obedience. There is no going to a concert or standing in a worship service that gets his attention. Obedience and surrender and laying down your sin, that's what he wants. 
And in this life, we'll hear many calls to compromise. Hebrews 11.25 calls it the fleeting pleasures of sin, hollow and deceptive philosophy, Colossians 2.8, and the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life, 1 John 2.16, all tempt us to compromise in areas we should never, ever, ever consider compromising in. And this temptation to compromise is often heightened by some type of fear, such as a fear of being rejected or being criticized. So if we aren't fitting in, that's how a lot of people fall in because they hate being singled out. Compromise is dangerous because of the subtle way that it approaches us. It isn't about throwing ourselves to the world, but rather accommodating the world. We don't want to offend anyone who's devoted to their sin. Or if we can't tell, we just don't want to offend anyone. But remember, offending God is a far worse choice to make and most who do this will never admit to anyone that they're denying Jesus for the world you won't hear them say that but Jesus has forbidden it and he's the only one who matters he paid the price he's the judge so if your choices aren't always standing for him and defending him you're in for a very big surprise unless you already know you're not going to get away with that with him. Compromise can be good. Compromise in a marriage is very good. And we must know when compromise is appropriate and when it is not. And in general, we can compromise on preferences, but not principles like the color of the carpet, the type of vehicle we want to drive, where to host an event, when to take a mission trip. There should be no compromise over values and its standards, such as the essentials of the Christian faith, including the gospel, the faithful preaching of the word of God, the way that it is written, the lordship and authority of Christ, our personal convictions, and moral issues as defined by the word of God, nothing else. We must be committed to living out our biblical beliefs and it is pointless to know or speak up for the truth if you do not act on the truth in the way that you live. That makes people more angry than just about anything else is people who preach but live the opposite. So I guarantee that everybody who has affairs or issues with women do not make the news. But the second a, pre a preacher does, he's all over the news, all over social media. And the reason that is, is because it is implied that he stands against it, that he is opposed to that behavior. Therefore, he gets thrown out all, all over the place for having done that thing. So don't do that because what it does is it again shames the cross of Christ. Don't do that. If you're going to speak for him, live for him. Do not be hip hypocritical anywhere ever with anyone for any reason. When our intention is to actively pursue a deeper relationship with Jesus and obey him in all things, we are far less likely to compromise. We will recognize the things that easily draw us away from him, and we will easily recognize his voice and trust him when he says, when he's pulling us back, we don't want to lose him. We run right back. God has equipped us to resist compromise. I want to say that again. God has equipped us, made us, built us, created us to resist compromise. And he's with us providing the strength when we expect it. So if you don't choose to stop compromising, you're going against the way that God designed you to work with him. You're fighting hard to disobey him. Philippians 2, 12 to 13 says, Continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. God's word and his presence nourish our souls. Others encourage us and walk with us, and we do the same for them. But when we're focused on God and in an active relationship with him and his people, we come to understand his holiness, his character in such a great capacity that the crushing nature of our sin and the depth of his grace, we just 
despise sin in our life. We hate it. We desire to follow him in all of our ways and to be a bearer of good news, of salvation to others, and of a very loving, safe place for them to be introduced to Christ. And the better we know God, the better we can resist temptation. Psalm 119, 1 through 4 says, Blessed are those whose way is blameless, who walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are those who keep his testimonies, who seek him with their whole heart, who also do no wrong, but walk in his ways. You have commanded your precepts to be kept diligently. Colossians 2.8 says, See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elementary principle, or elementary spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. We are to defend the faith, correcting those who oppose it or are confused about it, make it clear. We're supposed to be about the truth, speaking the truth, representing the truth, and always there to make the truth known. And we will stand firm and uncompromising in faith as we rely on the power of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. It's almost impossible, I would say impossible, to do without the Holy Spirit. If you somehow think you can do faith without the Holy Spirit, you're greatly deceived. Start there. The Holy Spirit is critical to survival in faith. Ephesians 6.12 says, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. We have the armor of God on as we engage in this battle. He gives it to us for that purpose. And the Bible warns us of the temptation that results in many being lured by the temporal. 2 Timothy 4, 3 through 4 says, For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but have itching ears. They will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. They choose it. They choose it. It is not an accident that people end up under false teaching. They choose it. I was lost deep in sin and I knew when I was hearing something that was not true. I knew from somehow God says he put it in us. We know the standard of God. If you choose to hear a gospel that allows you to live your best life, you are choosing it. You are rejecting Jesus. You are choosing it. God has warned us of the temptation to compromise, and he has equipped us to remain uncompromising. He told his disciples in John 14, 15, If you love me, you will obey my commandments. Jesus' followers enter into a compromising life when they live in agreement with compromise by choices they make, behave, speak, dress, or how they live. Our lifestyle must show Jesus Christ at every level. How you enter into compromise and slide into apostasy, which is a deadly eternal decision, is by coming into agreement with compromise in some area of living and thinking because the thinking will come out in your choices. It starts there. The devil does not care if we call ourselves Christians all day long. He does not care. He actually likes when we call ourselves Christians and live compromised because it cheapens faith for those who need to see it. It shows people that Jesus has no power it shows people that sin is actually um, a greater experience than Jesus. The devil loves everything about compromised Christians because they are the greatest billboard for him. They are the greatest and most successful missionaries for him. Those who stand up in front of congregations and say, come to Jesus, he will fix all your problems, you will be made well, you will have money. 
you will have a good life if you come to Jesus. They're lying to you. They're lying to you. He tells us to take up our cross. But most of us proved when we were living in sin that we have no problem taking up a cross to get whatever we want. So you can't balk at taking up a cross because we will do it for whatever we want. You just have to want Jesus more than those things. God knows we're willing to do it for what we want. He knows we're willing to suffer terribly for what we want. Compromise is a terrible sin in the eyes of God because it denies God. It dishonors God and it undermines the word of God. And it brings glory to a path created by the devil. And as believers in Jesus, we're never to agree with or compromise with Satan in any form of sin or ungodliness because we all have legitimate reasons to compromise. Without compromise, there actually would be war every single day. In every relationship, there's the risk that one or both could be so selfish and self-centered that they refuse to compromise. So in relationships, compromise can be a very healthy and a fruitful thing. This is a different kind of compromise. There's the good kind and then the kind that God does not tolerate. We should not compromise on faithfulness in a marriage. We should not compromise on criminal activity within a marriage, on abuse within a marriage, on any kind of behavior that is forbidden by God. That should never be compromised on. But we should compromise on things that are like not of principle, just for the sake of keeping relationship healthy. A relationship will not last if the people in the relationship are refusing to compromise in it. And Christians should be actually about peace first if they can and be willing to compromise in order to promote godliness, but never in any way to betray Jesus Christ. We should not ever return evil for evil. God says that. Don't do it. The negative aspect of compromise is mainly the aspect that we are going to live in agreement with the ways of the devil, which is I do what makes me feel good, or God, which is I submit myself to the cross of Jesus Christ. This world is not my home. I am a traveler here. I'm going to take as many people into eternity to heaven with me as I can. Isaiah 42.8 says, I am the Lord. That is my name, and my glory will I not give to another, neither my praise to graven images. No man can serve two masters. You cannot serve God and mammon. Matthew 6.24 You cannot serve God in the world. He's very clear you cannot. There is no possible way to serve both. Allegiance shared between God and other people or things is a compromise that will make you what he says is an enemy of God. And this is why the gospel in this country is so flawed, because it makes that acceptable and it is not acceptable in the Bible. God says it is not acceptable. It will not come to heaven. That's why it is critical that you read the Bible for yourself because you cannot be friends with the world and think that you are friends with God. He calls you an enemy. Our total and ultimate love, worship, and service is what God wants from us. Nothing else can replace it. You can preach all day long. You can share all kinds of Bible verses on Facebook. You can fast every other day. You can play worship music all day and all night nothing else that angers him if we try to replace the main thing with something else another idol don't do it obey Jesus and every day you decide each one of us will decide which kingdom we're going to walk in either we're going to bend God's principles to conform to our desires or we're going to bend our desires to conform to the standard of God, one or the other. It's a kingdom decision. And any time that we compromise our integrity as a follower of Jesus, 
there's going to be an endless ripple of damage from that moment into eternity. You have to ask yourself, how did you become so comfortable throwing Jesus under a bus to embrace an idol? Sadly, many will say they were told they could have both. Compromise, as long as it's not in murder or bank robbery, it's not a big thing. I promise you it is a big thing. It's a lie is what it is. It's unfaithful to God is what it is. So compromise is what tells you that you can have both. And Jesus and the idol, one will win. And you get to determine which one will win. And you're saying that Jesus promised never to leave me and that his sacrifice paid for my sin is going to fall flat if you don't repent in turn before you meet Jesus. There is no sacrifice left for sin once you know the truth. Jesus, help us. Please help us. We recognize that we have come, likely come under judgment in this country, and we certainly see it amongst our peers. The, just in a day, the reports are so tragic in one day anymore. The stuff we didn't hear for maybe once a month, a few years back. You are screaming for our attention. You are screaming for people to wake up. And if people choose to not wake up and hide in distractions, I pray, God, that you allow whatever it takes for them to be shaken out of their stupor so that they can turn and be saved before it's too late. We all love people that we know are not even close to paying attention to the point that we're at in time. So I ask you, God, on behalf of all of us, shake us all. Shake us and our loved ones. I ask that you shake until we actually listen. And shake us until we care more about other people than our own comfort. And that we strive to bring more into the kingdom every single day that we're allowed more breath. Many aren't getting it today. They lost their lives before today. So thank you, Jesus, for your great mercy for us. Thank you that you have tarried and tarried with us. We deserve nothing from you. I deserve wrath. There is no question in my mind. I deserve your wrath. But you are so good to me. So I thank you and I ask that you help me in every way to become more and more honoring of you in how I think and how I speak. I bless everyone who is hearing this and I ask for a remarkable, stunning, life-changing touch from God. In Jesus' name, amen.